Dear fellow redeemed. What a strange set of readings. <laughs> what a strange set of readings. From the very first book, we've got the account um, of, of the murder, the very first murder that we hear of, of Cain killing Abel. And we've got all this extra detail about the, the life of Adam and, and how Adam had a son in his own image despite having been created in the image of God. And then our second reading, you're thinking to yourself, well, this might get a little bit better because there's some really, really cool pictures of Revelation. Like, like God's people all clothed in white with palm branches of victory in their hands and we hear about these, these songs of heaven. And the songs of victory that, that just almost reach our ears and, and pluck the strings of our heart even as we try to live in this world where you and I still walk in the image of, of Adam. And instead we get this account of, of a dragon trying to eat a kid and then the, the child being taken up to heaven and then 1,260 days, three and a half years, out in the desert. Okay, Ben, by, by the time we get to this gospel lesson, it starts to make sense. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just the song of Mary, right? Mary has, has come to visit Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is overjoyed that the mother of her Lord would come to see her, even though nobody else knows, besides Mary and Joseph, nobody else knows that Mary is pregnant at this time, first trimester and all. And Mary bursts forth in this song. My soul proclaims the greatness of my Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior because he has looked with favor on the humble state of his servant. The Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. You might think to yourself, oh, that, that, that makes sense. You know, one out, of, one out of three readings kind of makes sense, but where the other two fit, well, maybe, maybe not quite so much. But I'm here to tell you today, what I'm here to tell you today is that the other two readings really describe the rest of our life for us. The other two readings, the first reading and the second reading, describe the rest of our life for us, even as we join with Mary in singing the song and the words of that third reading. Think for yourself, fellow sons and daughters of, of Adam and Eve. Think for yourself how the dragon, the serpent, Satan, the accuser, the liar, <laughs> has tried to steal every bit of joy that you have ever held dear. Think for yourself how Satan has introduced his own lies and his own accusations in a life, in your life, into the, even the, the closest relationships of your life. The lies and the accusations that lodge so deeply in our hearts and ingrain themselves in our minds before we even recognize it. Lies and accusations that say, oh, the, the real problem is out there. The real problem is my, my boss and his or her expectations. The real problem is that other coworker who is always giving me a hard time. The real problem is, is my kids, because they don't sleep, and, and they're kids. The real problem is, is my spouse, because it's his attitude or her attitude that really needs to change, and if, and if it did, then life would be great and grand and easy and wonderful. The lies that weave themselves into our hearts as though the dragon is still trying to chomp at our heels, still trying to steal away the joy that God has given to us. The accusations. If God really loved you, do you think, fill in the blank, it doesn't take too long before our minds go there. If God really loved you, do you think your life would look like this? Do you think that would have happened to you? How could a good God really let this happen? And since it did, doesn't that prove that God must in some way or somehow be a little bit of a liar? The accusation, the real reason, that you're sitting where you are and feeling the way you do is because you've fallen short of the glory of God. And the real reason you feel this discomfort within yourself isn't because of 
of the extra you know, 10 or 20 pounds that I've found a home around the waistline. And the real reason isn't, isn't the, the career advan advancement that didn't happen or the bonus that wasn't quite as much as it maybe could have been. The real reason you feel this discomfort with yourself is because deep down you know God has standards and deep down we know that we fall short. And that accusation, almost said with, with slithering tongue, that accusation sticks. And we believe it. Because there's the barest hint of, of truth to that. You see, the devil knows how to use God's word. He, he knows it better than you and I. And he knows how to pick and choose and reinforce and repeat. Before falling into temptation, he keeps saying, tempting, Oh, Christian, don't you know? <laughs> don't you know God is a God of grace? He'll forgive you. God is merciful and compassionate. Haven't you read the Psalms? Come on. And then afterward, Oh, <laughs> and you call yourself a Christian? Baptized into Christ? Uh, I don't think he wants you based on what you did. The accusation, do you think God could really forgive you for that? Yeah, that, that when, when Pastor talks about forgiveness at the very beginning of the worship service, how's it go? God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And it's almost like the devil is there with, with slithering voice to say, Oh, <laughs> but it's not for you. Or it's for everything that is yours except that one that you kind of keep tucked away and, and you have to be the one to, to inflict guilt upon yourself. You have to be the one to, to shoulder that burden and drag it along behind you because deep down, deep down, you know what God's law says. And surely, the devil says, surely God cannot forgive that. That forgiveness is for somebody else. And with that kind of inner dialogue going on in our hearts and our minds, the accusations that are lodged against us, some of them stick, and some of them, no matter how hard we try, and no matter how many times pastor says it, well, that's not quite for me. Not here. Not now, not today. Maybe another day. Maybe after I suffer a little bit more and carry that burden a little bit longer and then I'll finally, finally be able to forgive myself. <laughs> what sort of a myth is that? I preached that in a sermon once. Who's the most difficult person for you to forgive? And you think about it and you might think, well, that person really hurt me deeply and this person was very close to me and they betrayed me. Who's the most difficult person for you to forgive? And, and this was... Probably my first, coming up on my first full year as a pastor, so it would have been summer of 2012. And I said, well, maybe the most difficult person for you to forgive is, is yourself. Is yourself. Because the forgiveness sounds like it's for somebody else, but it's not for me. And there's an element of truth to that, but at the same time, at the same time, it's this skewed idea of forgiveness that says, I've got to make the move, I've got to do the action, and I've got to be the one to finally let go of this burden. It's almost like the last little slither of the snake's tail as he sinks the last little tip of his fang into our own heels, trying to rob that little bit of joy from our Christian lives. As if to throw up our hands and say, well, what is the use? If pastor says it, but I don't feel like I can forgive myself, where do I really stand? And <laughs> what's the difference between Christianity and, 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 and everything else? And I'm here to tell you today that when Mary sings her song, she's not so much singing about what she would do and about her own effort. She's singing about how God has been faithful. She's singing about how, how God has been faithful because when you get down to it, the most difficult person for us to forgive um, is, is not ourselves. 
because that assumes that forgiveness is something that I must do. But God is the one who gives forgiveness. God is the one who promises forgiveness. And so when we talk about the most difficult person to forgive, the real question is, do you see? Do you see what and how much and to what extent and through what tools God has already accomplished your forgiveness? What and how much? That the most difficult person to forgive isn't really the question. The question we ought to be asking, did Jesus really win forgiveness for all people? And so on Christmas, perhaps a Christmas card should include a picture of a dragon on the front cover. The failed attempts of the devil to try and stop the salvation that God was working out. The failed attempts, such as King Herod wiping out all the, the boys of Bethlehem who were still of nursing age. Maybe about three months after, that's our best guess, about three months after Christmas, all the boys of nursing, nursing age, he doesn't, you know, he sends the soldiers there after the wise men show up and the wise men don't show back up at his place. And he sends the soldiers there and he doesn't say, well, go through all the, the houses and look at the birth certificates. He wants to make sure we, we, we get this kid. And so he probably says to the soldiers, you know, as long as the kid's not on solid food, just, just kill him. And you can imagine that serpent slithering through the streets of Bethlehem amidst the mourning and the wails as another bit of joy had been robbed from God's people searching and finding that one was missing. And you can imagine Mary and Joseph returned to, to Nazareth they go down and they leave Jesus at the temple by accident and, and was he in danger? Who knows? But he made it back safely with his family. He begins his public ministry there in Nazareth and the people want to throw him off the cliff. Finally, the serpent will win. And the serpent will strike. And Jesus walks through the crowd. Time and time and time again, Jesus reinforcing that the devil would not be able to steal the joy that he was winning for God's people. Time and time again, Jesus reinforcing that he would win and the devil would lose up until that very moment when it looked like the devil had finally accomplished his goal of striking the heel until the third day when the stone rolled away and so beautifully depicted on that stained glass window behind me the devil's head crushed under the rolling of that stone so where does that leave us? that forgiveness is an objective and completed fact but you and I still stuck out in that desert for 1,260 days Revelation 12 verse 6 the church of God, God's people. The church of God, this kingdom that God has prepared and made you a member of through faith, still living in what looks like this wilderness, still living with the image of Adam imprinted on our hearts and our lives, still living with the joy that we feel like we ought to have that isn't there because it seems like Satan has managed to steal a tiny little bit from it, from us living out there in the wilderness, God's people, living by God's promise. And so when Mary sings, her song isn't just whistling past the graveyard of all that, that line of believers from Adam to the present day. Her song isn't just mental distraction to say, well, you know, here's what I see with my eyes. Everybody dies and life is sinful and life is terrible and horrible and the devil takes joy out of my life and he's constantly accusing when she sings. She focuses our voices and our hearts and our minds and our eyes on what God had promised to do. And she reinforces it for you and for me that God has looked with favor on the humble state of his servants, you and me. The mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. 
and his mercy is with those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has crushed the devil's head, body slammed him to the ground, and stomped on his face. Oh boy, is that a little bit much? Because that's how completely Jesus has conquered the devil. And that's how utterly complete our victory is, no matter how often and no matter how long, for the rest of your life, the devil stalks you. And doing his best to steal that faith from you, doing his best to siphon every little bit of joy from your life. So dear fellow, fellow redeemed, in the wilderness with our Lord, <laughs> my only request today, really, is that we understand the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness being the external things that happen to us. Well, it kind of fits. Happiness happened to us. I'm, I'm happy, you know, if all of a sudden this, this windfall comes our way. I'm happy when I, I get to where I'm going with 10 minutes to spare. I'm happy when, when the kids listen and they get a full night's sleep. I'm joyful. I'm joyful as this internal emotion shaped by the words and promises of God. I'm joyful because of what Jesus has won for me and done for me. I'm joyful because that no matter what my heart says, and boy, <laughs> it can say a lot, but no matter what my heart and my emotion may say, God says that he raised me with Jesus at the baptismal font. God said that he has given me his own body and blood together with the bread and the wine for the forgiveness of sins as an objective and completed fact. And that even though this body will one day turn back to dust, the, the, the body and the blood of the immortal Son of God has been planted here. And the forgiveness of sins has been washed over this body and yours as well. And that one day, God will raise even this body from the dust of death. Restoring. Absolutely restoring every bit of joy that the devil had siphoned away during the 70 or 80 years if God gives us the strength. Happiness happens to us. External. Joy what God has done for us coming from within. And about the best way I could summarize this is um, these words from, from one of my high school classmates. He, played, uh, he played, played center for a football team, and I was way out on left tackle, and uh, my feet weren't quick enough, but there's nobody that was <laughs> big enough to, yeah, long story. Anyway, Brett Bengal is his name, and he's a far better athlete than I. That's, that's the only point, and this is what he wrote. Uh, December 23rd, 2015. That was the day I woke up in Houston to caulk windows, but by 10.45 p.m. I was in Appleton, Wisconsin saying goodbye to my dad. It was three going on four Christmases ago. The grandkids are older and do new and exciting things. My dad even missed the Chicago Cubs win a World Series. If you're not careful, your mind can create a list of many things to be disappointed and depressed about regarding a loved one's death. How true is that? Your mind can create a list of many things to be disappointed about. Then the Lord works in wondrous ways. Fast forward to Thanksgiving 2018 at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Citrus Heights, California. I'm sitting next to my mom and family when Pastor reads 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'm so grateful that my dad knew his Savior. Even though I miss my dad, I can be confident every day he is in heaven with Jesus. I am so grateful to be raised in the Christian family. The word continues to be passed on from generation to generation. Yes, it can be sad, reflecting back to December 23rd, 2015, but it can also be joyful. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth on that first Christmas. Thank you for carrying out the plan of salvation to perfection. Thank you for taking our sins to the cross. Thank you for preparing a place for us in heaven. Because of your grace and mercy, we may be filled with joy, knowing our loved ones are celebrating their salvation with you in heaven. Someday, we'll be celebrating with them. I hope this Christmas season everyone will have the opportunity to hear the good news of their Savior Jesus. 
if you are struggling with some, something, get back in the Word and return to the family of the church. You see, that peace isn't just part of one season of the year. Through our Lord Jesus, peace can be a way of life. Thank you, Jesus. And I can't think of a better way to, to really wrap it up. That when we talk about this peace that goes beyond all understanding, it's a peace that, that Jesus has won for us, that he's promised to us, and that he reinforces again and again as he gives you his word and his body and blood again and again. So no matter where you sit, whether it feels like, like you're standing next to the angel with the, the devil's head crushed right there, or whether it feels like you're being pursued by that snake who's trying to snatch every last bit of happiness from you this holiday season. I just say, take a deep breath, and let's focus again on the joy that Jesus has won for us, and the forgiveness that he actually gives to us. And that even though we live in a world of turmoil where you and I, <laughs> in the image of Adam, experience far too, far too little happiness, even though that is the case, Jesus himself has promised us joy today and forever. And if there are any, any doubt, listen to his invitation once more. Take and eat. Take and drink. For you. Crushed. Amen.